Thank you so much, uh, you all fan of the extreme <laughs> and the very uh, devising movie, uh, Neon Demon. It's a movie I love a lot, but we are very excited and proud to have the uh, director of photography with us uh, tonight. So please come on stage, Natalia Breyer. <laughs> of people's state. <laughs> You're going to have to justify so many things. <laughs> I did not shoot the end title sequence. Um, no, I know. And um, Nicolas is not here to do, um, explain certain things, but I it's good to have you because we, when Nicolas is here, he talks so much, you end up not asking any questions. <laughs> And then you don't actually know, he, like he leads you wherever he wants to, and then you, uh, you're still with, left with the same, but why? <laughs> um, I, you know, to, to we, I don't know if many people were here earlier tonight, we had a discussion with uh, Natasha and also cinematographer in the series, so we talked a lot about why you wanted to become a, um, a DP, and like, you know, like your career and choices. So I don't really want to repeat this unless um, people have questions they can ask uh, after, after a discussion. But maybe we can start just with Neon Demon and your collaboration with, uh, with Nicolas. It's the first time you work together. I assume you were aware of, um, you've seen maybe his previous film. Okay. Um, so you knew what you were getting yourself into. Um, can you talk about uh, the collaboration that you had with him? Uh, he, he has, he's, he's a strong director in terms of like mise-en-scene and, and you know, visual composition. Uh, and I think a lot of people know he's colorblind. So I'm sure as a director of cinematography, it could be interesting to, to have a collaboration with him. And you know, if you want to talk about this to start. Yeah, I, I didn't know Nick, but I knew his films, most of his films. And uh, so when I got the call to meet him for the movie, um, I was excited about you know, working with a filmmaker that is um, as daring as he is. Um, I loved some of his movies and didn't like as much other of his movies, but what I really admired on him was that um, he really had a strong vision as a director and he was always trying different things in every movie, never going for uh, drive to or whatever was successful, never stay in, in his um, comfort zone. And um, always trying quite risky proposals. And um, I thought when, when I got the call, I did not have a script. I knew what the subject was about. Um, but I was immediately interested in, in just creating something with an artist like him. And then they did give me a script, um, which was actually a fake script <laughs> because he didn't want to give out the real script, but I didn't know that. So I read the fake script, which was, it was the same kind of theme, but the story was quite different. And uh, it was a lot of dialogue. And I could just really not see, you know, that as a Nick Reffin movie. But of course I wanted, you know, to meet him and see what he has to say about it. So I went to the meeting and we talked for like two hours uh, about a lot of things and about fashion and being foreigners in LA and cinema and a, a lot of stuff. And then we got to the moment where we talked about the script and he was like, okay, so what did you think about the script? So I'm very honest, like I cannot lie even if I try. Uh, and also when you're going for a meeting, you know, you're kind of deciding if you're gonna get married to this person for half of the year. So I ha also had no interest in not being authentic, so you know, I started to say, well, you know, like so much dialogue. I don't really see you in the movie. It's very explanatory. And then he laughed and said, oh, yeah, yeah, I just got the fake script. <laughs> I was like, okay. And he's like, yeah, that you know was for you know the financiers to give me some money. It's not gonna be any dialogue. It's gonna be like totally different. I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then I was like, okay, can I read the real script? And he said, yeah, I'll send it to you. I was like, okay, great. I came out and I thought I had a great meeting. You know, this could be really interesting. Let's see how the real script is. Uh, and as I'm driving home uh, from the meeting, my agent calls me and he says, Nick, offer you the movie. And I was like, yeah, but he didn't send me the script. Like, I don't know what the, what the script about. And he said, well, you know, he offered you the movie now and the whole town is 
you know, wants to do this movie, and he, if, if you wait, he might meet somebody in, a, you know, in another meeting or in a coffee shop when he goes for a coffee tomorrow and hire, you know, whatever, Chris Dog. Anyone could be, you know, you're in LA. So maybe you should take it. I was, I was like, okay, you know, I, I trusted the conversation. I, I knew his body of work. And I was like, whatever we do, the two of us together, it's gonna be something interesting. Um, I knew I was going to have a, you know, a, a, an interesting ride, an interesting creative collaboration with him. Um, so I never in my life like took a film like so blindly, kind of like after one meeting, and and I was like, yeah, I'm I'm in. And then this is the yeah, result. Yeah, after one meeting where you got to fake scripts, and you were still not sure, you, you know, if you were going to be married to him for six months. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, so also Nicholas has uh, this way of like he shoots in um, everything chronologically. Yeah. So I assume when you're working on the film as a cinematographer, that can make it very difficult. Yes or and no. It, it's difficult for okay. the electricians and the people that have to do the same thing like five times, and they're like, "Why didn't we shoot all the hotel scenes in two days in the hotel? Why do we have to come here once a week?" to shoot for three hours and then, you know, pay for the crane five times instead of one day. And, um, but eventually they also understand it. Uh, but for me it was actually great. And, you know, I think for the actors as well, I mean, for everyone really, because what happens is we're used to making films following the time is money for a line. So, because everything is so expensive, right? So, but if you would, make a parallel with painting, it would be like, okay, today you have the blue paint, and make sure you paint everything that is blue, then you're giving the blue back, never have the blue back again, and then tomorrow you get the red paint, and then you paint the details, and that's how you make movies. And it's not organic, but it's efficient economically. Um, so the way Nick designs his whole projects because he's his own producer is like, well, I'm going to have whatever, very little paint, but I'm going to have all the colors, you know, and I, I can go back. And so going chronologically makes you really feel this, the story organically and see what's working, what's not working and change the script as you go. Um, and the script changed a lot because some things are working, some things are not working, and you're not attached to something that you already shot last week that comes after this, and now you have to do it. You can really create in a much more organic process. And cinematography-wise, it's also amazing because, yeah, even if I have to go five times to the hotel, you know, every time I'm coming, I'm just coming from the previous emotion that I just shot two hours ago or yesterday. So every time I'm lighting the hotel, is different. And um, also, as the movie gets crazier and crazier, uh, I could also go crazier with my treatment of light and framing. Um, and I could, um, you know, follow the dramatic curve with the curve of the shooting. And um, it was the first film I shot on digital. So when I started, I, I had done a lot of commercials on digital, but when you're doing a commercial, you don't get all the time to experiment before and test with the cameras and follow the whole process. So I was still kind of getting to know the, the camera and I had resisted to shoot a film on digital for a few years because I was still not happy with the results. And so this one was like a big challenge for me, especially being beauty, like I really wanted to shoot it on 35 so bad. Um, so throughout the movie, I started to <coughs> learn this beast, you know, like be, become friends with the enemy and experiment more and um, distort the image more and play more with things to break the perfectness. And it was amazing the fact that we were shooting chronologically because I, that progress is also like a dramatic curve in terms of cinematography. You know, I could become crazier and crazier and I was like mastering more my tools and okay, now I'm gonna try this crazy thing. And, and Nick is also very open to experimentation and he's not scared of failure. He would rather 
you try something that it's brave than staying in the comfort zone of safety. Like safety is like the worst thing you can say to Nick Reffin, you know, like middle ground. He would prefer that some people is walking out of the movie and some people is loving the movie like in an insane way that they're tattooing themselves. <laughs> but nobody's like, uh, yeah, yeah, you know. So as a DP, it's great to work with somebody like that because it's just pushing you all the time to the extreme uh, and allowing you to fail, which is the only way that you can really like let go now when you see the film, do you think you could have done something like this on 35 or it's not um, really? I think uh, it would have been different mm -hmm. if, because I had to find new tools um, to make peace with digital and to look at the monitor mm -hmm. and not be like, oh, it's too clean, it's too sharp. So if I would have shot on film, I would have done a lot of things very differently. So I wouldn't have the challenge to destroy the image and flare the lens and start painting on mm -hmm. the filters. And How much, uh, when you're done shooting then, what, in terms of the grading process and like working afterward, does that give you more work because you shot on digital or less? Or was it an easier process for you to learn? I don't work too much on the grade because I light everything on camera and okay. I make such radical decisions on camera that there's not so much leeway after, there's no way back. Um, the, this was the first digital film and the color correction was longer, especially because the equipment in Denmark couldn't handle the amount of data so it was like very slow to to do, uh, but um, it was a fair amount of learning curve for me on how some things are different uh, on digital that I only got to learn at that point because we didn't have so much money or time to test before. But apart from that, all the principles are the same. Yeah. And you mentioned you were familiar with um, Nick's previous film. Um, but before shooting this film, and you know, and I know you got the fake, fake script, maybe at some point you got the real one, but did you do any preparation or did he show you other films for you to look at? I don't, I mean, I think he has a, a, his own like uh, universe, oh. and you also have your own universe in terms, you know, of contrast and, and colors. But did you make, did he, did he make you like watch something specific in terms of genre maybe to? Get in the mood. He had the like film? a ten movies, like a list of ten movies, but they were the same movies for me, for the musician, for the actors. They weren't cinematography references. It was more in terms of the mood, and they were also different. Uh, it was from Rosemary's Baby to Suspiria, um, some Kenneth Anger uh, short films, um, sure. Valley of Dolls, uh -huh. you know. Uh, then the other one, The Return of the Valley of Dogs. So they were all really opposite in every sense. And I guess the message was somewhere where all these crazy movies meet might be the, where, you know, where we're doing Me and Demon. It was more like to start a conversation and have something to refer to sometimes, but he, he never gave me any reference in terms of image, like no photographers, painters, color palette, uh, we just talk a lot about feelings and moods and the story and the characters and then we spend eight weeks prepping which were mostly seen locations and the whole process of selecting the locations was what gave us a common language of starting to understand what we were looking for, what work what didn't work. And, you know, we did the movie with five million which is nothing to shoot in LA, so we had to be very clever with the locations because we didn't have money to paint a wall. You know, we had like two moments where we could do something like in the motel room and, uh, and the swastikas at the end. That was almost uh, <laughs> everything that we could intervene because we did. So the, the choice of the location was a big part of the creative process. And after eight weeks of spending every day doing this together, we had 
some idea of the universe, but then it just, I, I, we took a lot of photos um, during the scouts, so I would take photos with Artemis, and we would talk about shots, and uh, I would have them in, in my iPad, in a document. So we had kind of a roadmap of uh, what we wanted to do, but then that all was changing all the time during the movie, and a lot of scenes were changing completely or disappearing or new scenes coming. But we had that kind of common language that we had developed, and, and then, you know, throughout the movie, we discovered the beast that we were <laughs> creating. <laughs> It's an interesting movie to show in the context of a female case because, you know, there's a lot of gazing uh, of female body and all men looking at women. Um, was it something that was interesting to you, like, as a cinematographer to, like, represent the gaze and the gaze of someone, of someone, on someone, maybe? Yes, of course. Uh, it, was, it was really interesting to, you know, to portray that that word, and to criticize it using the same elements that that world uses so well, and it, that is so seductive and interesting to watch. So there's like a big contradiction there, and that's what I find fascinating, and that's what most of the audience in America didn't get. <laughs> But um, some people Except like the movie. Guys. Yeah, Except thank you, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, when the movie came out, people had um, people always have expectation now, with especially with Nick in terms of like yeah, making Drive Two and Three, and and he never does the same thing. So it was a high expectation on that film because of the topic too, and and the actresses, and then we're like, oh. It's not just a fashion shoot. It's like all pretty. It's pretty, <laughs> but very disturbing. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, um, where do you when you work with Nick in terms of like collaboration, like where you sh you put the cameras? Like, is it like you decide everything you want, or is he very controlling in what he wants you to do? Um, with the lighting, I. I was just doing everything that I felt, mm -hmm. um, and 99% of the time he loved it. Um, sometimes he would say, "Can you make it darker?" And I would be like, "Yeah, perfect." <laughs> you know, I'm used to like people asking me, "Like, can you make it a bit brighter?" Um, with the camera, we really worked together. Um, mostly during the prep, we did all these photos, and then I would put them in a document, and I would show, "Okay, Nick, this is you know from what we've been talking today." These are the shots we have for the scene. And so we kind of had that Bible before we started. Um, but not only that, also through going through all this process with him, I could pretty much get into his head and understand what was his point of view on each scene, um, where he was positioning himself as the director and what was really essential and important to convey in every scene. So sometimes if we didn't have the storyboard or the storyboard was going out of the, the window for whatever reason, uh, it was like we had already created a code. So it wasn't difficult to find what's the new way of seeing this. Um, a lot of people that was on set thought that we had done a lot of movies together. We didn't know each other, but it was like a really good, you know, it, we just danced together very well from the beginning. Um, somebody called us the evil twins. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I kind of like that. <laughs> do, do you know what uh, work of yours he may have seen before you worked together? Or did you, is it something you discussed with him? Um, no, before I'm you actually became the evil twins? <laughs> no, I'm not so sure what he's seen. He, mm -hmm. Nick doesn't talk a lot about other filmmakers' work somehow. Uh, but also about his own you previous movies. <laughs> no, it's like he wants everything to be like kind of fresh and a new thing. So I don't think he ever mentioned something to me, and I didn't ask him like, okay, which films did you see? Why, why am I in this meeting? You know. But I think he also wanted to have a female cinematographer because it was the first time he was making a film about women, and um, he probably felt that it would be good to have a woman by his side which means that the choice was very narrow. That's why I got the job. 
like three options. You, you're, you're so nice about yourself. <laughs> um, three women? <laughs> well, yeah, maybe a bit more. Okay. Yeah. Mm. 15. Mm -hmm. um, and to talk maybe um, outside of the Neon Demon, although I think we can talk about Neon Demon for a long time, was there any movies that you've seen where you wished you had worked on as a cinematographer or, like, or something that was like, oh, I really wish I was able to shoot that film or work on this or maybe working with a director? I think we talked about Lucrecia Martel um, mm -hmm. a little bit, but was there anything other than that that you wish you would have been able uh, to work on? Or travail. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, but um, for Lucrecia, you nearly worked with her. Um, I got a call for Headless Woman. Um, she was last moment changing cinematographer. And I happened to be on vacation in the jungle in Venezuela. So I got the call a few days late. And by the time I got the email, and by the time I managed to arrive to a phone and called the number that said in the email and get through to somebody she had found some, somebody else. So that's she how close I got to work. She didn't wait long enough for you. It was um, a few days and she was in a hurry. Yeah, but you saw uh, Headless Woman since? Yeah, 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 I love, I mean, I love and Lucretia's you, movies. You were happy with the camera yeah, work on yeah. it? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a great movie. Yeah. Maybe we can take a question from the audience now. We. Have microphone? Yes, yes, we have microphone. So there's someone here. Hi, thank you so much for that. That was gorgeous. Um, I was just wondering, it felt a lot like the images were motivated by the music, especially in the scenes with the pulsating lights. What was your relationship to the music while working on that? Did you have it beforehand? Or were you listening to it on set? Or was it mm -hmm. composed afterwards? Yeah, all the score was composed afterwards. Um, but we did have like a playlist of maybe 10 songs that Nick was playing a lot on set, like a mood. And sometimes we were playing it as we were shooting. Um, very different to the music that is finally on the score. But uh, after Neon Devon, I spent two years um, doing commercials with Nick, so everything he shot for two years, we were going around the world and doing commercials, and we always had those 10 songs. So maybe he's got these 10 songs for 20 years, I don't know. I thought it was like the Neon Demon track, but then it was like the Shell track, the, you know, everything track. So, yeah. What are the songs? Real songs also? It's kind of electronic music that only he knows. I don't, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> these people. One is Bauhaus, and, uh, and then there's a beautiful Brian Eno track that we listen to a lot. Uh, it's called uh, An Ending, but nothing to do with what's... Okay, so it's not Cliff Martinez. Like no, 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 no. There's nothing Bauhaus? is Cliff. Yeah. There's a Bauhaus song? Hmm? Bauhaus? Yeah, there's one. Which one? Uh, Bella something is dead. Oh, Bella Lugosi is yes. dead. Yeah, but <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> it would make sense. Yeah, <laughs> everything. <laughs> um, there's a question there. Um, what was the most complicated or or um, stressful setup to do that ultimately became really satisfying or made you really happy? Everything was, you could say that was complicated just because we had very little lights and very little amount of people. Um, so it was kind of a challenge, like how you do this with little stuff. Um, but somehow I think nothing was too stressful because we, we kind of had the time. We shot in eight weeks. So a Nick cares about the image so much that he's not going to rush you to do it. So I'm usually very fast, but on top of that, I knew that I had hit my back covered by him. Like he would, he understood, OK, we don't have a lot of people to do this. And if it takes, you know, half an hour more, then we're going to have something great. Um, so 
maybe the party at the beginning just because that was day two of the shoot and in day two everyone is getting to know each other and you know you're still not like working as a machine and it was very big for the crew I had so we had to light that whole theater you know two floors and stuff and we didn't have enough lights or people so probably that was um, the most stressful Someone here? Hi, um, nice to meet you. I <laughs> uh, just wanted to ask you, you mentioned that um, Nick gave you a list of 10 films as reference, um, but was Under the Skin in them by any chance at all? <laughs> For the next film, <laughs> you can Not crazy you? enough. Conventional. <laughs> <laughs> I saw someone in the back. Is someone here? Yes. Hello, and thank you for such a wonderful trip of cinematography. I've been uh, meaning to watch this film for a very long time because I'm maybe trying to pursue a career in uh, film, which I'm still kind of working around, and uh, I wanted to know how much creative control do you have as a cinematographer? And also, because I'm from Venezuela, I wanted to know what, um, what you were filming in Venezuela. Thank you. What I'm filming in Venezuela? I was not filming. Um, I went to research, to do like, a, I had a, my best friend from film school is from Venezuela, and we, she wanted to do this film that she never got the money, but Film 4 um, was gonna finance it, so we went there to take photos and do like a portfolio to present. And then we went to the Gran Sabana, and um, we just fell in love with the jungle. And then I just stayed there for three months, like living in the jungle and doing crazy things you do in the jungle with no electricity and anyway that's a long story uh, but yeah i never shot anything there but i i went back every year for like six years for a few months to that place in, in the jungle is like my spiritual home uh, and what was the other question the, the creative, creative control um It's funny to think about those words with Nick because creative control is like the creative process with him is actually about letting go of control and creating from a different place. And that's the shooting chronological and experience in the movies. Actually, yes, I had a lot of plans and I have to plan beforehand and the electricians have to lay out the cable before we have to shoot so you have to control um, uh, plan the creative process but at the same time there is so much room for creating in the moment and finding other things in the moment um, but I know that's not the question but I, I was interested you know suddenly the word the word control it's like kind of the whole idea is to lose control and create from another place. But um, in terms of the specific question, um, I was able to just do anything I wanted. I mean, as I said before, the, we were creating the, the camera together um, and I was just doing whatever I felt was what I wanted to do with the lighting. And 99% of the time he just loved it and the few times that he said something he was to improve it. It was one day that maybe I didn't have so much energy and he was like, ah, Natasha, come on, go crazier. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I'm, this is like too normal. Okay, let's just put some red on the filter or whatever, you know, some glitter somewhere. So yeah, I felt uh, probably freer than ever in a, in a film, in a narrative film context, because I could really approach it 
more as an abstract poet than as a responsible narrator. I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, you know, other films like, for example, The Swimmer that I did with Lim Ramsey were also very open briefs and um, very organic uh, on the creative process, but we didn't have to tell a story. It was like a 20 minutes film about a swimmer for the Olympics, so we could, you could do poetry. To be given the room and the permission and the support to do poetry on a narrative film, um, it's a lot more tricky. And Nicolas is great for that. So he, he gave me all the freedom and the room to explore and push my own boundaries. And um, it allowed me to do things that I hadn't done before on narrative films. So I'm very grateful for that. In general, do you get more creative control in like in all you shoot compared to working with Nick or? I feel it was total creative mm -hmm. control. It was like a beautiful collaboration. Like we were totally in sync mm -hmm. in terms of mise en scène and camera. And for lighting, he just never asked me to do something specific, always let me do my thing. And w whenever I was not brilliant, he said, hey, wake up, do you want some coffee? Like, this is shit, like, spend okay. another half an hour, what do you need? I was like, I don't know, it's not good. It's like, you know. So, I felt really free, I feel, felt really supported and really pushed in a good way. Uh, someone here? Yes. Hey again. Um, I think this film says a lot about sort of beauty, and I, especially for women, it can be a very particular topic of discussion. So what was your role as a cinematographer in terms of making sure that in the collaboration process, it not only reflected like an idea of beauty or a topic discussion of beauty that you were comfortable with, but also did it, well, I'll just leave it at that. Does, also that what? does that make sense? I'll just leave it, I'll just leave the question there, but is that, does that make sense? I, I don't understand the question, sorry. So because the movie is so centered around like female beauty, which is, and can be a very sensitive topic, especially for women. Did you take, do you think that you did anything in the collaboration process to sort of make sure that you guys weren't stepping on the wrong feet in terms of that conversation or that it presented your views or on the conversation the way that you wanted to or you felt comfortable with? What would have been to step in the wrong feet? Well, I think in, in terms of talking about beauty with women, I mean, for example, if, we, if someone in the movie had hair like mine and a bad thing was said about it in the film or it was portrayed in not the brightest light, there could be black backlash for that from people who have hair like mine, from people who have struggled hair like mine. Like, oh, why would you, you know, from women, why would you, you know, not support curly hair? And not saying that that's an analogous um, example or parallel example, but just in terms of like the sensitivity of beauty. Because this is, like I felt a lot of, I felt a lot of things that I've had to deal with in my life in terms of beauty by watching this. And like, and like seeing the other characters. So I thought that was really interesting. And I wanted to, you may or may not have seen this when you read the script or during the process, but I was wondering if you did and if you, as the DP, wanted to do something to sort of, I, I don't know, maybe guide that, that topic, guide that conversation. Well, first I think your hair is beautiful. Oh. I don't know what's the <laughs> problem with the hair. Um, uh, but um, 
Um, I think the whole point of the movie is to talk about this absurdity of the, 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 the paradigm of beauty that we're all following and how women are victim of this stupidity and not just women, like the whole society because we are just following these standards. Um, the movie is, what is interesting is that it's using the language, it, it's borrowing the, the seductive language of the fashion industry and the advertisement industry and the, what we decided that is beautiful, which is like women that look like a concentration camp, uh, escaped from the concentration camp like a week before dying or something. Um, I, I think the film is using that, it's making almost fun of that. You guys were laughing at the end when I <laughs> came in the theater. Um, um, it, it, it is the way that he decided to criticize the, um, this world using their own aesthetics and tools. I don't think Nicolas is worried about being politically correct. Um, and I am working for him and his vision, so I'm not going to worry about that either. So we just went insane all the way. And hopefully a lot of people understood that we were actually criticizing <laughs> this. But uh, yeah, a lot of people didn't actually understand that and, and felt offended by it, which I found hilarious. Um, but yeah, you cannot make films for everyone, you know. Uh, we're going to take a couple more, so there's one here, yes. Hi, um, just one other question. Uh, in town right now, actually, there's a theater piece at the Park Armory. It's actually a stage adaptation of a film called The Dam by Eva Van Hove, and I saw it last night. And um, the, the comparison I can make between the production I saw last night and the film is that it can be whether whatever it is, theater or performance art or you know film, I think it can be so powerful when things are filtered down to the very core, like the pure performance of it all. You know, even in the most narrative form too. So it's not you know the acting isn't about just acting. Acting actually becomes performance. You know, it's not about being a woman from that kind of background or whatever. It's actually like, what does it mean to want something? What does it mean to be that, you know? So it's very pure, and I, and I find that very powerful. But watching these things, you know, uh, I, I admire to, I aspire to create work like that too, but I have the fear, right? Because you've been saying, you know, in order to be creative, you have to actually let go of control, and you have to kind of step out of the comfort zones and whatnot, but I, I, I find myself to be always sort of you know, I want to do that too, but you know, something's always holding me back. So I don't know, as a creative person, what advice can you give? You know, have you been given an advice when you were, I don't know, starting out too? And if you could repeat that, that would be great. So you know, e e every human is different, and every artist is different. So for Nicolas, that's the process. But I think you know, Kubrick was not about losing control. So I don't know who you are. Maybe for you, you know, your expression comes from control, and that's okay. Like, you know, everyone is different. I think the the key and the most difficult thing, not only in filmmaking but in this existence as humans in this planet, is to find who you are. And so that's all you have to do: just to find who you are and be in alignment with yourself, and, and you create from there whatever that is, and everyone is different. You saw the play The Damned? Uh, you saw The Damned? Yeah. The, the play? But did you see the movie too? Or? Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. <laughs> well, you guys are screening it here. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We, just, we just did a Visconti retrospective, and, and we're bringing it back because it was sold out every time. So, yeah. so um, okay, great. <laughs> I haven't seen the play. Uh, there was a question in the back, I think. Uh, yes, there. Um, hi, Natasha. It's very nice.
nice to meet you. You mentioned you did crazy things in while well, shooting the movie, like painting on the filters. I was wondering what were other technical stuff you tried out while shooting? Is Charlotte here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I started painting like halfway through the movie, very subtly, um, to blur the highlights. And I was doing like the old photographers or cinematographers. I heard when I was in film school, um, like getting you know your the grease from your forehead and painting with your fingers. And um, as the movie developed and became more crazy, I started to do it more, and Nicholas loved it. So then that developed into a lot of different substances, including glitter and stuff. And then my filters became like Jackson Pollock canvases where every day I had to find a new substance to use. Um, so that was the main thing I was doing and then I also started to flare the lens with different stuff. So I, I, that all started with Neon Demon but I was kind of starting to discover it and then it developed in the next few years, mostly with Nick doing commercials around the world. Uh, but it's now part of what I use all the time and um, so I designed different devices to flare the lens. Uh, so I have a collection of torches that I point at the camera and different qualities of light. I have uh, very fine tubes um, with LED inside where I used to, f I use for flashing the, the, the negative, the chip, whatever it is, the digital thing. And, um, and I keep trying, so now I have like three suitcases of stuff that I just put in front of the lens or different lights that I flare to the lens and I keep trying new stuff and then my crew gets ex excited so they're all bringing new stuff like, oh, now you have to try this and stuff. So uh, sometimes I use ham grease to paint on the lenses um, and yeah, anything I find, you know, just go to the craft service there's always something like jelly beans, whatever. Everything can be really interesting to put in front of your filters. You should try. <laughs> but you're vegetarian. <laughs> uh, but I do eat jamón because every movie I have a leg of Iberico, Cinco Jotas, in the camera track. It's very important. We have to finish on that note because we can't talk back. But you're coming back tomorrow to talk about another work that you, you did a few years ago. Um, I bring uh, a sweater tomorrow. <laughs> you had a sweater earlier. I don't know what you did with it. I just left this morning for breakfast and I never came back to the yeah, hotel. Yeah, I know, so I, know, I, know, I know you're shivering. Happens, yeah. So you'll have a sweater tomorrow. I'll have one. Tomorrow. You're coming back. And, and we'll maybe a blanket, like a grandma. <laughs> yeah, it's something for the legs and something for the top. And we're also uh, going to show the miseducation of Cameron Post with um, Ashley Connor, the DP. Yeah. And we have more things uh, coming up this week. So thank you so much for tonight. Thank and you. we'll see you back tomorrow. <laughs>